Lord, we are broken so often. And we stay broken because we forget that you are broken so we can be healed. Forgive us for letting songs placate us without actually realizing what we're singing. God, help us know the victory of your scars, that we would know the power of your resurrection. God, help us know how to walk whole, victorious and not victim. How, God, you take our pain and you use them for your purposes. And you bring us, Lord, to freedom. Lord Jesus, I'm asking today that as we hear your word, we wouldn't just hear it as individuals that we would hear your promises to your body and your family that we would be one in you in Jesus name in Jesus name Amen 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 If you want to turn and greet someone Maybe it's a high five. Maybe it's an air hug. But look at each other and realize we're family in the process. And for those of you joining online, I'm so glad you could be here. Forgive me if I'm a little emotional. It's interesting when you study the promises of God and, and you, you look at the pain you've been through, but the promises that we have, and you realize how much pain you put yourself through because you didn't look at the promises, there's, there's a sense of solemnness, there's a sense of humbleness, there's also a sense of uh, joy. And, and, and today, that's where I'm hoping we're at. I'm hoping today we can hear the Word of God for what it is, I'm hoping we can hear his purposes and his plans for us, our identity and who we are. But before we get started too far, I do want to let you know, one of the core themes of what we're going to be talking about today is this understanding of what it means to be one body, inheritors of God's covenant. But it's interesting because so often we've looked at that through the lens of uh, our church. Guys, if you wouldn't mind putting it on my left side, I would appreciate it. Thank you. And just off just a little bit. Thank you very much. Minister Manny, I hope you're okay with that. We're going to be talking about that. But do you all understand that the body of Christ is much larger than Kingdom Life Christian Church? And, and that's my hope and my understanding, and that's going to be in the back of our mind. But, it, you know, unfortunately, we don't get to celebrate that too often. And unfortunately, it, it only comes in these moments where we're, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a family, right? How often is it you don't see the extended family unless there's a wedding or a funeral? And usually more often the funerals than the weddings, right? And, and, but recognizing that we're part of a larger body. Well, one of the things that I'm very excited about is we get to remem remember that we're part of our larger body and celebrate something. Um, and so over the next four Saturdays, we are going to be partnering with Cornerstone Christian Center and the Storehouse Project on uh, something called the Farmers to Families uh, Project. And we're going to be feeding, at least this coming weekend, 576 families. Yes, this is not just like, hey, bring your box of macaroni and cheese. This is actually five pounds of fresh meat, 
12 pounds of fresh produce, five pounds of fresh dairy products, and a gallon of milk. And it's possible that may even double the week after that, up over a thousand families. But we're going to go one weekend at a time. But what I'm excited about is that we get to be the body of Christ in this region. No competition, uh, the, uh, no, 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 no denominational. We're here and say there's a world that's out there that needs us. And this just becomes both a symbol and an action of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And I'm excited about that. We're going to be having uh, fairly soon this weekend there will be a registration link. So here's the deal. Two Saturdays, we'll be doing distribution here. Two Saturdays, we'll be doing distribution at Cornerstone Christian Center over on Wheeler's Farm Road. But here's the idea, is that not Kingdom Life staffs this one and Cornerstone staffs that one. It's that we as the body staff both. So maybe you don't make a reservation to serve here. Maybe you make a reservation to serve there. Uh, And so the volunteer link is going to be coming. It will be on our website this coming week, so stay tuned. But I think it is very fitting for that to be the way we kick off this message. Today I want to bring a message in keeping with what we've been teaching over the past three weeks. My message today, if I'm going to call it anything, is going to be called the Covenant of Community. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. Lord, I so recognize the weight, the privilege, and the joy of your word. God, the weight of it, because we're accountable for that which we know. Father, the hope of it, because when we follow it, you have given us promises which go beyond what we can imagine. God, I'm asking today that you would make my words clear, that we would grow forward as a family, as a body, that a world around which is so divided and fractured and hurting needs to see. Thank you for your leading in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start this morning, and we'll get back to it, but I want to start with our reading, and it's going to be found in the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. You may read along with me. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his control, and that he had come from God, and he was returning to God. So he got up from his meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towels that he had wrapped around himself. He came to Simon Peter, who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize what I'm doing now, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, have, now that I your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Leave your finger there. We're going to be coming back to it. 
I want to give you just a reminder and a bit of a trajectory over where we've come. So three weeks ago, I began with a message on what does it mean to be co- in covenant? What is a covenant? And in short, the, the shortest version I can give you of a covenant was that it's an agreement between two parties, right? It's, it's two parties coming together and they're, they're, they're coming up with a goal. They're coming up with something that they're going to agree on, that they're going to uphold together. Um, and it's, it's, it is always understood that it's for the benefit of the both of them. It's not just for the benefit of the one or the benefit of the one separate from the other. We talked about the difference between a contract and a covenant. And in a contract, the idea is that we come to an agreement that's beneficial for both of us, but if you don't hold up your end of it, then I'm, I lose my benefit. And so because I lose my benefit, I'm going to, we're, we're going to hold the contract in breach and we're going to dissolve it. A covenant was a little bit different because they started with the same premise. It was the understanding that two parties came together and they recognized there was a benefit for them both. But in the event that one party did not uphold the agreement, it didn't dissolve the agreement. It just meant that the one party who held to the agreement continued to hold on to it regardless of whether the other party ever came back into agreement. And the interesting thing about it is we don't conceive of that because for us, that's unfair. It doesn't seem fair that you could be in an agreement with somebody, they not hold up their end of the agreement, and you're stuck in it. But the thing is, if you're looking at it through that lens, you're looking at it through the lens of what do I get out of the relationship? And the difference between a contract and a covenant was the recognition that both parties entering into it did not enter it for what was in it for them, but what was in it for the other party. Okay, how does that then begin to apply? Because we understand that throughout history, God made covenants with man. There was five different covenants. Pastor Marco brought that through really well. Uh, There was the covenant to Noah, the covenant to Abraham, the covenant to to, uh, um, um, uh, Moses, the covenant to David. And then he brings us full forward into this, what's called the new covenant, which we'll begin to talk about. But in each one of those, especially in the first five, there was this promise that God made. And there was this understanding. It sounds almost contractual because if you will do this, then I will do this. And the reality of it was, it wasn't that God ever breached the covenant. So some will say, well, yeah, it's a contract. Uh, Man had to do what God told him to do. Uh, And if he didn't, then man wouldn't get, uh, you know, there wouldn't be, you know, the promise that God made. But the difference was this. That in a covenant relationship, God always held true, waiting for his people to come back and repent. He didn't consider the covenant or the contract broken. He waited until his people came back. And when they did, they found that the covenant blessings were still in place. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So for us, when a promise is broken or a contract is broken, that's it. There's no coming back to the table. It's like, nope, sorry, been there, done that, not doing it anymore, we're all over. In this sense, it's the recognition that that promise stays in place, okay? So we understood that that was the, pro- the, the process of covenant. Pastor Marco then came in and he began to talk about this understanding that we have this covenant of love. Because the reality of it is, is you'd never had two enemies come together and make a covenant, they would make a contract, which they would call a treaty, which said, as long as you treat our country properly, we'll treat you good. But man, you step out of line, we're wiping you out or we'll die trying. But never in the Bible do you find a covenant that's made between people who are not of the same. So that's why when when Paul talks later on in, in, in Corinthians, he says, what fellowship is there between light and darkness? How can you be unequally yoked? Because when, when, when two parties have a different starting place, there's no way they can have covenant. And so what is it that requires a covenant? What is the, the thing that makes a covenant happen? And the answer is love. And he began to build this beautiful understanding of how, how love is what is the fuel for a covenant. Love is what causes a man and a woman to look at each other and say, because I love you, I bind myself to you. 
And it's a promise that's unending, that when you're weak, I'll be strong, and hopefully vice versa. But at the end of the day, we stand before God and our family and our friends, and we say, well, God has joined together. Let no one put tear apart. The problem is, again, in society, we recognize that marriages dissolve way too easily, and maybe that's been you. Maybe you've experienced the pain of a broken marriage covenant. See, God understood that, because he recognized that as humans, we struggle with the idea of covenant, and we default so easily into contract. That's why when we understand the covenant of love, we recognize the love that God talks about that we're supposed to share. It's not this love of uh, the, 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 the brotherly love. Uh, it's not even the familial love. It's not even the love of eros. The, and it's that thing that binds one another together in a marriage, that, that spark of sensuality, which is a wonderful thing and a gift from God. But the reality of all of those are receiving loves. I'm in my relationship and I receive, I feel arrows. I feel uh, family love. I love my best friend, but they're all about what I get. But none of those can make a covenant. They're important if you have a contract. But in a covenant, what binds it together, the love that God uses is called agape love. And it's a giving love. It's, a, it's not about what I get to have. It's about what I have to give. And when I enter into that covenant relationship, I enter eyes wide open saying, I'm coming and making agreement, not because I expect to get anything, but because I expect to give everything. Why? Because it's out of that understanding that I recognize we all or both parties succeed in that relationship and in that covenant. Then we understand the next Pastor Marco talked about, and he began to break out this understanding of now that we understand what a covenant is, we understand that a covenant is bound together, it requires love at the center of it, then we recognize that love needs an expression. And, 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 and the problem we have is this. When we recognize the covenant we have with God, where he says, uh, and I'm going to explain this out a little bit, but when he says that, you know, I've come to give you life and life in abundance, if you will come and you will repent and, and you'll turn your heart back to me, I will be my, your God. And, and, and it doesn't say I'll be your God and you will be my person. It says I will be your God and you will be my people. But the problem we have so often is that we understand God and, 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 and our relationship with God through the lens of me coming to God and me getting from God. And, and of course, I'm going to bring back to you worship God. And, and of course, I'm going to give. And of course, I'm going to serve. But the key word in there is still I. And in covenant, there is no more I. And when we understand this, Pastor Marco began to talk about the recognition that we have such an individual mindset when we approach Scripture, we approach the promises of God. But the reality of it is, the covenants of God were always represented to family. And so we find throughout Scripture, we say, you know, the, 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 in, in, in Deuteronomy, he used a Scripture where he says, you know, here is my word to you. He says, you know, if you will do these things, if you will take these words that I've given and, and, and tie them as, as symbols on your hand, meaning the word of God be on your actions, and the word of God tied to your forehead, meaning the word of God tied to your thoughts. Why? Because if I am thinking about God's word and it's tied to the way I think, it begins to come out in my actions. And then he says, if you put them on your doorpost, meaning that, that wherever you are, your home, that God's word is what guides your home, then guess what? The promise is that you will be, you will be provided for. You will understand uh, God's rain and dry seasons. You'll understand his promises, what, but not just for you. It was for you and your children and your children's children. Matter of fact, there's a scripture over in Hebrews. I bookmarked it. Or sorry, not Hebrews. Isaiah, just in case. Isaiah 59 says this. As for me, this is God speaking. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on and forever. He wasn't talking in Isaiah 
about this understanding that if you just teach your kids the rituals of the early covenants, meaning if you will make the sacrifices that are appropriate, if you will live in community with one another by this set of prescribed laws, then so will your descendants. He was pointing to something greater, something bigger. He was pointing towards something that we now call the new covenant. Because see, in the first four covenants, it was all about what do I need to do in an outward fashion to maintain this promised relationship with God? And so we find in each one of these, we get to the, the Mosaic where we're the Mosaic covenant where God says, here's the sacrifices that I'm giving you. Now here's what happened. When people sinned, they had to bring a blood sacrifice. They, whether, it was, whether it was sheep or bulls or goats or even small birds, it depended on the sin and it depended on the, the, the ability of the family to be able to provide. And what that did was it did a few things. Number one, it was supposed to forgive them or release them from their sin, but it was also a leveler. It wasn't just about that person getting their sin fixed. It was also about the fact that because of that, we can remain community. And so the rituals that God gave in the early covenant were about something about not only purifying their heart, but binding them together as one. Because everybody looked at one another and recognized we've all sinned, we've all fallen short, we all need to do something about it so that we can remain the chosen people of God. But the problem was they got to the point where they became so dependent on their rituals that their rituals ended up separating themselves from each other and from God. You know why? Because, number one, some of them began to be, well, if, if, if a small sacrifice is a good thing, well, then maybe a bigger sacrifice is a better thing. And then people who didn't have the means looked and they clearly couldn't be as righteous as others and so there began to be division among them. And at the same time, those who had, they became dependent on the ritual to forgive them and, and so they let me make sacrifices and let me do big good things for God. Why? Because if I do that, clearly I will be a better chosen person. But all it did was it bred even further division, further dissatisfaction, and it also made the people become more dependent on their acts than recognizing the acts that they had were meant to point to their dependence on God. Somehow they elevated themselves to think that they were equal with God in the covenant promises, and things began to fall apart. All of a sudden we get to the place where God's chosen people who were supposed to live in community became individuals. They began to be dissatisfied with what they had. They began to become prejudiced with who they were. And they began to fall apart at the seams. And God said, if you will turn away from me, then in this covenant understanding, I will turn away from you wasn't that God was looking and saying, hey, listen, breaching contract, that's it, we're done. What he was saying was this, the consequence of sin is my inability to walk in relationship with you. But God said, I will never forget you, but my covenant is there will be a point of restoration where at some point will come when you will no longer depend on the sacrifice of bulls and goats to make you in relationship with God. You will not have to be dependent on ritual for relationship with me because I will put my spirit within you, my love within you, and I will change you from the inside. I will be your God once again and you will be my people, not because of what you do, because you're incapable but because of what I do, because I am all-sufficient, all-powerful. And we understand that Jesus became now for us the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. And so we're not dependent on those rituals anymore, but now we become dependent on God. And it's a beautiful thing. But the reality of it is, is we so often step back into the same situation. Okay, now that I'm dependent on God, hey, he's forgiven me of my sin. We've created for ourselves our own new rituals. And the things that are supposed to be good, we've become dependent on. 
We become dependent on making sure I go to church, making sure I at least listen to church, making sure that I read my Bible or I give my gift or I do whatever. And the thing about it is all of these examples are good. They're things that we should do, but they were meant to be symbols of something else, not the total, total sum of everything else. Because Jesus said, I have called you not to be individuals, but I've called you to be my body. Let me give you scripture for it. Over in Hebrews, we find this scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 15. The Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts. I will write it on their minds. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where they have been forgiven, there is no, more sac- no longer any sacrifice for sin. Thank you, Jesus. You have forgiven me of my sin. I can go my own way, and I can be a Christian by myself. But that's not what he was saying. Because he doesn't say... I will, this is the covenant I will make with you. He says, this is the covenant I will make with them. He doesn't say, I will put my laws in your heart. He says, I will put them in their hearts. He says, I will write them on their minds. It's not just your sins and lawless acts I'll remember no more. It is their sins and acts. What was this saying? The promise of the new covenant was you will no longer be dependent on sacrifices to be the community I've called you to be. You will understand my sacrifice, which calls you and enables you to be the community I've called you to be. Yes, I recognize that Jesus died for my sins, but he died for my sins so that I can once again be community with him. I can be the body of Christ. We can be one together. But even within that, we have to recognize that, okay, thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, which gives me the ability, and I will now make my choice to be one. But what does that even mean? And the answer is found in John 13 that we've just read. I'm going to give you some highlights. Number one, we look at the story. We find Jesus, and he's at the... Last Supper, we call it, the Passover meal. He knows that in the morning he's going to be standing ready to be judged and, 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 and he's ready to be executed. He also understands that not only is he going to be executed, he is going to be betrayed by one of the men who's sitting at the table, one who's been with him for three years, one he's trusted with the money. But the whole time, all those years, Jesus knew the heart of Judas Iscariot. He knew the brokenness and the weakness of the man. But it's interesting because the first point I want to look at is verse 1, the end of verse 1. He says this, Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Having loved them as his own, he now showed them the extent of his love. I need you to understand something, and you're going to understand this a little bit more as we finish this part, piece of the scripture out. Jesus didn't do anything haphazardly. Everything he did was for a purpose, and so he showed them his extent of his love. How then did he show them the extent of his love? He begins this next piece. How? Number one, he knew that Judas Iscariot would have been prompted to betray him. But here's what Jesus knew. Jesus knew that Judas, the betrayer, was sitting there ready to betray him. But Jesus knew something. He knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got up and he removed his outer garments and he began to wash his disciples' feet. That's the first thing we see there. Is the recognition that Jesus' first act towards demonstrating community started because he knew who he was in Christ and where his authority and where his power came from. 
And so often we hear a message that we're supposed to do good for our enemy. We're supposed to love our brother and sister in Christ and we fall short. And the reason we fall short is because we forget who we are and where our authority is meant to come from. Jesus was able to go and look at a betrayer and do something which is utterly unthinkable in that moment. See, we don't understand this. When he took off his robes, what is he doing? He's stripping himself of his identity. Why? Because the robes signified him as a rabbi or a great teacher. And he says he took him off. He says being a great teacher isn't important. And then he goes all the way down to his undergarments. Why? Because he's saying vulnerability is the most important thing. But I can't remove my identity of self and get vulnerable unless I know who I am on the inside because it's what's on the outside is irrelevant unless there's something different on the inside. And the first act of community starts by knowing who you are in Christ and being able to be vulnerable beyond what you think or feel. And he begins to wash their feet. And I go on from there because he gets to Simon Peter. And he says... Jesus replied, because Peter goes, no, 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 no. You're not touching my nasty, di dirty, smelly feet. I mean, you're the master. You shouldn't touch my feet. And Jesus goes, you do not realize what I'm doing now, but you'll later understand. You know what the other thing of community is? We don't serve community. We don't serve one another because we understand or they understand what we're doing. I love somebody not because they love me back. I love somebody not because I'm expecting to get something. Matter of fact, I love them even if they don't understand. There's times I look at my children and I ask them to do things or I will do things for them. You know, this is, you know, my kids are amazing, right? So I'm going to give this one little flaw, right? But I'm not giving this flaw like it's my kid's flaw because it's really all of our flaws. It's just at different levels. But it's easy for us, especially as parents, right? When you do something really good for your kids and you know what it costs you, but they treat it as if, well, that's kind of expected, I don't not do it because, well, they don't appreciate it. Although there's a side of me sometimes that it's like, you know, it'd be nice if you just appreciated that a little bit more. But I do it not because of that. I do it because, why? I have a covenant relationship with them. They don't understand what I'm doing, but I understand what I'm doing because what I'm doing now and loving them, they don't understand now. But one day they'll look back and hopefully they'll remember that good thing I did. And it won't be for like, oh, daddy was such a good daddy. No, hopefully they'll do it because they will then carry that same principle out to their own children. Jesus washes their feet, blows their mind. Not under they didn't understand. Jesus did it anyway. He didn't go, let me tell you what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it. Now do it. Now I'm going to do it. He just did it because he knew what they needed, regardless of the inconvenience and the struggle it would be for him. Peter even looks at him and goes, okay, God, well then listen, hey, if my feet are bad and if, if I can't have any part in you, then well then wash all of me, right? And it's this mindset of like, well, you know, if a little bit's good, then a lot's got to be better. And, 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 and Jesus is like, no, 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 you're missing the point. You're thinking it's about me washing you. You're thinking it's about you getting cleaned. And you're missing the point. It's not about you getting cleaned. It's about me being vulnerable and me being open and me knowing my identity to serve you, even though, Peter, you don't know this yet, but you're going to betray me too. Peter's only thinking in the lines of ritual. Oh, well, if, if the master wants my feet to be clean, he'd probably want my whole body to be clean too. And Jesus says, no, I want your heart cleaned. Why? Because I have a purpose for you. You're going to run off from me. You're going to hide from me. You're going to abandon me. You're all going to run your own ways, but there's going to come a point in time when you're going to understand and you're going to come back together. But when you come back together, it can't be about you anymore. It's got to be about you as a family, not as individuals. So he moves on from there. And when he finishes this, once he finishes and he puts his clothes back on, he goes, now, do you understand what I've done for you? He says, you call me your teacher and you, and you call me uh, Lord. And, and that's true. That's right. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I've set an example for you 
that you should do as I have done for you. So here's what happens. We go, oh, I get it. We're now supposed to wash each other's feet. And you know, there's sections of the church that have looked at foot washing as a sacrament. And they've elevated it along with communion and baptism to foot washing. And listen, I love that. That's wonderful. But here's the problem. If we think that somehow me walking out there and going, you know, Pastor Marco, uh, come here. I'm going to wash your feet. Is somehow making me holy or somehow down demonstrating whatever. No, because you know what I can do? I can find the dirtiest, nastiest feet and wash them and feel better about myself because I've washed the worst and dirty feet of them all. And I've elevated it back to ritual again. And I've missed the purpose because Jesus was saying, it's not about the foot washing. The example I've set for you isn't how to scrub some dirty toes. The example I've set for you is how you love others regardless of the fact that you know they've betrayed you or hurt you or are even going to do it. Because it's when you do that, there's a hope of becoming the community God's called us to be. Why? Because his covenant was not just for me. It was for me, for you, for us, our children and our children's children into the following generations. We're called to be a covenant community. But the only way we can do that is we have got to stop looking at each other through ritual eyes, through the eyes of what we get out of it, through the eyes of what God will do for us if we just do nice things for one another or good things or, or, or going to the farthest degree of, of I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to lay down, I'm, I'm going to love everyone. Why? So that I will know God's love. No, I don't care about knowing God's love if we don't know God's love. He's called us to be the body of Christ. He's called us to be the family of God. Why? Because he said it's now through the church, his body, that the world would see him. But we're still trying to be one individual in Christ or a great collective of individuals. And he's saying, no, I'm calling you to be one in me. But then he gives us these reminders of how we do it. He gives us symbols. He gives us the symbol of baptism. You know why? Baptism was this moment where we go in, we, we get baptized out of obedience. We say, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? I believe that you died on the cross, that I could be free of them, and that you call me to die, and so I go into the waters of baptism. And baptism becomes symbolic of being buried. I'm burying my old way of living. I'm burying the sin, the shame of my... I'm burying it in the waters of baptism. Why? Because the waters represent both burial and cleansing. When I rise up again, I'm raised up. It's resurrection. I'm, I'm, the old life is gone. Sin, shame, I don't have to be bound by it anymore. I come up new. But guess what I come up to? I come up to be a part of the body of Christ. It is symbolic of cleansing, but it's symbolic of changing my family. I've gone from the family of sin and death to the family of life. And that's why when we have baptism, sometimes you have no choice but to baptize where you only have a moment. But the reality of it is, is when we get them into baptism, it's about community. I'm now identifying with the body of Christ. But then we get to communion. Because we see after Jesus washes their feet, he then moves into this next covenantal moment. Matter of fact, in Luke, he, he spells it out. Luke is one of the ones that, that understands it best. In Luke twenty two twenty, 20, he says this. In the same way after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out of you. What is the new covenant? The new covenant is you're not going to sacrifice, depend on the sacrifice of bulls. You're not going to depend on the sacrifice of, of sheep anymore. You're not depending on that anymore. You're now depending on the sacrifice of my body, my blood, which is shed for you to forgive you of your sins, but also to make you one in me. That's why Paul would say over in 1 Corinthians 10, he said this. He said, uh, it is not the cup of, is it not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation of the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, 
for we all share one loaf. We come to the table of the Lord. If you have your communion elements, I'd like you to take them out. Maybe you're sitting there online and you have them. The table of the Lord is so full and rich of meaning and purpose. But if we make it about me, then we've missed the point. The table of the Lord was two things. It was both symbolic and lived out. It was a symbol because it was a sign of something. It was a sign of the covenant, but you can't have a sign without understanding the truth of the sign. You can't have a symbol without understanding the truth of the symbol. The reality is I could have the truth about knowing what communion is, but if I don't have a way to act it out, it's meaningless. So the body of the Lord is about his sacrifice for us. It's about his understanding that he has paid the price of our sin. He's died to make us whole. And I thank God for that. By his stripes, Isaiah said, we were whole. By the wounds he took on his body, we were made whole. By his blood shed, we were cleansed of our sins. But if that's truth that's in my head, but I'm not prepared to live it out, then it has no meaning. But without understanding the truth, I also don't have the ability to live it out. Here's what I want us to understand as we partake in communion today. We partake in communion, the broken body of Jesus, accepting his forgiveness, accepting his healing. But we also receive the body of Jesus, recognizing he's called us to be one. And in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul goes through the famous last table dialogue where he brings it back up, but he's making a point He's not just giving us a liturgy. He's making a point. He says you need to know why you're taking it and how you're taking it. Why? Because if you don't take it in a worthy manner, you're actually bringing death upon yourself. And what he's saying is this. If you take this thinking that somehow it is healing you, but you have no part in the covenant with one another, then you bring death upon yourself. Spiritual and eventual for real. But when we take this, we are making a covenant reminder that as I belong to Jesus, I belong to you. We are one body with many parts, but one body, which means we're going to have to love one another even when our feet stink, even when we know we're going to be betrayed by one another. We love one another not because we're loved back, but because Christ has always loved us and he has a promise for us. As I've meditated on this, when I take communion, I want to share something with you that I think about. I'm going to read an entry from my journal. Normally we read scripture, but I want you to read this a little differently. Communion is messy. It is a table where brokenness is the food and drink where vulnerability is the key and betrayal is covered with thankfulness. Communion reminds us of our need for unconditional grace and love in spite of our selfish nature, which is so prone to forget the brokenness and the pain of those who sit at the table with us. Yet in the middle of this meal of suffering and pain, we find healing in life. Yet only as we choose to lay down our own lives, our own emotions, Brokenness, betrayals, longings for justice and retribution. Only then do we find the true hope that the table of the Lord offers and provides. Jesus, amidst the gathering of friends who would betray him, gave himself thankfully. His eyes looked beyond it to the selfless, gifted shepherds they would one day be. He saw them not as those filled with sin, but gratefully as those who would one day be filled with his spirit. Today, as we partake of a communion, we partake of a covenant act which says, Lord Jesus, I'm one with you and I choose to be one with my family. Regardless of my sin, regardless of theirs, we will love 
as you have loved. We will be one as you have prayed for us to be. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and he broke it. Give me thanks. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We receive of your body broken for us, Lord, that we may walk whole as one. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, giving thanks for it, he blessed it, and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember, Lord, your blood shed, for without sacrifice there is no covenant. We receive of your sacrifice, and we live our lives in remembrance of that. Give us your grace to love as you have done. In Jesus' name. Lord, I ask that the words that have been spoken today will not fall on empty ears, but we may we live out who you have called us to be, one body, many parts, the demonstration of your love to a world that is broken and dying, that they may see your life. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Athena, would you come?